Hello everyone, welcome, bienvenidos a todos. My name is Irma Marquez Trapero and I am the Executive Director of Latino Lead. I give all of you a warm welcome today for a very, very important conversation about the quality of life of the Minnesotano, the Minnesota Latino community here in Minnesota. Uh, again, as I shared, my name is Irma Marquez Trapero. I'm the executive director of Latino Lead, a nonprofit of Minnesota Latino leaders and organizations that come together uh, to really have a greater social impact through collaboration, power building, and leadership development. I am honored today to have been invited for this important conversation with an amazing group of Latino leaders here in Minnesota. I will be both playing the role of moderator in addition to a participant. Um, and I would love to just begin by also sharing, you know, we are um, having this conversation both in Spanish and in English. And so if you would like um, the translation of today's conversation, um, please do um, go to the bottom of your um, of your of the webinar and click on um, on a button on the bottom of your screen so that you can have that differentiation. Uh, si ustedes están aquí con nosotros en este momento, pero desean tener esta conversación uh, por interpretación en español, abajo se encuentra un botón que pueden seleccionar para que esta conversación sea en español. Así que muchas gracias a todos los que están ahorita con nosotros. And without further ado, I would love to begin by uh, sharing about what we will be doing today. So we have here the president of CLUES, Comunidades Latinas Unidas en Servicio, Ruby Lee. We also have uh, Rosa Toc, who is the executive director of Minnesota Council of Latino Affairs. We also have um, the executive director of ACER, Rodolfo Gutierrez, and ACER stands for Hispanic Advocacy and Community Empowerment through Research. And last but not least, uh, the folks who invited us to have this conversation, we have um, the Honorable Justice Alan Page, who is the co-founder of the Page Education Foundation. And a little side note, I am a, uh, an alumni of the Page Education Foundation. So in many ways we are coming full circle. Thank you so much, Justice Alan Page for your support in education always. Um, and finally, but not least, we have um, Aline Cheromov, who is the Senior Vice President of, um, let me get this right, um, a Senior Community um, Vice President of Community Development and Engagement at the Minneapolis um, Federal Bank here in Minneapolis. We are so honored to have all of you in this conversation. And so we will, you know, begin with some questions, but we really truly want to hear from you. So make sure that throughout our conversation today that you um, have your questions in the Q&A section, and I will be uh, looking at those and hopefully we get those answered for you throughout our time today. So make sure that you continue to give us some of those questions throughout. And finally, you know, I want to really ground us in who the Latino community is here in Minnesota. And for that, I would love an opportunity for Rosa to share a little bit about, you know, who the Latino community is, um, where do we live here in Minnesota, and give us an overview of some of the history of our powerful and mighty Latino community here in Minnesota. Gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Irma, for your warm welcome and uh, buenas tardes. Uh, and thank you as well to the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and Aline Churmov for hosting this conversation tonight. It's also a pleasure to be with you, Justice Alan Page, again. Uh, thank you for being with us this evening and be part of our conversation. It's really a treat. And as usual, it is great to share this space with my colleagues and friends, uh, such amazing and dynamic leaders in the Latino community. I'm very honored and excited to be here with you all. I just wish it were with, with you in person, with tamales and ponche, something to warm us during these uh, winter days. 
Uh, as Irma indicated, uh, my name is Rosa Tolk and I am the executive director of the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. We are a state agency in the executive branch and our main role is to advise on policy and legislation that benefits Latinos in the state. Part of our services to Minnesotans is to be a bridge between the community and state government and inform and educate about Latino issues and the community. And we wouldn't be able to do that without partnering with many Latino organizations, uh, local leaders across Minnesota and other state agencies. So to frame this conversation, uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about some general socio-demographic characteristics of Latinos in the state. Uh, just recently, we released a brief report with uh, data. I had it here from the 2020 census and the American Community S Survey that uh, draws a portrait of uh, who we are in Minnesota as uh, Latinos. Uh, as Irma said, and um, I will also add uh, a link to our bilingual report on the chat later if the audience uh, wants to access it. But uh, our respective organizations here and many other Latino organizations uh, serve and work with more than 300,000 Latinos in the state. To be more precise, According to the 2020 census, the data that was released this year, we are officially 345,640 Latinos in the state, or 6.1% of the total population. So thank you to all Latinos who completed their census questionnaire last year. I'm sure that your participation also helped us keep all of our eight congressional seats. Very likely that was the case. So two things didn't surprise us. One is that we grew in numbers as it was expected. In the last 10 years, we grew by 38% in the state. And in comparison, Minnesota's overall population only grew by 7.6%. So that's the good news. And second, the Latino community, especially children, were one, once again undercounted. Uh, despite all the hard efforts that our organizations and many other organizations and leaders across the state did to make sure that everyone got counted, according to a recent uh, study by the Urban Institute, uh, which did a simulation uh, of the historically underrepresented, uh, undercounted uh, communities in the US unit the census, it appears as if we were undercounted here in Minnesota by almost 2%. And that's a lot of people that were missed and that were not counted. We know some of the reasons behind it, the pandemic, of course, that hit our communities very hard, disproportionately very hard, the lack of investment in planning and promoting uh, the counting by the federal government, and that famous citizen citizenship question that was never in the questionnaire, but uh, very likely um, made people afraid and distrust, distrusted the process. So we won't know for real the, the real percentage of the undercount in the Latino community until next year when the census releases the information, but that has an impact on the distribution of federal funds uh, for programs that can benefit our communities uh, and also in terms of political representation. At any rate, based on these official numbers, uh, here in Minnesota, we are the third largest demographic group, and this growth will continue. Uh, by mid-century, it is projected that uh, we will be a little bit more than uh, half a million Latinos in the state, approximately 566,000 of us, if we are still here. I don't know if I'll be here, but many will be. Um, and the other thing that is very important to mention and that we all kind of know is that uh, the Latino population is uh, very young. Almost 40% of Latino Minnesotans are under 18, and the median age is 25 years old compared to 38 years for the state. As we know, we are not a monolith. 
Uh, we are a very diverse community with very diverse ancestries, including ling linguistic diversity. And we live in every county in the state. Although two thirds of us live in the metro area, the population growth in the last 20 years uh, in the Latino community has been in greater Minnesota. So this is why the percentage of Latino students in districts uh, as far as Crookston in North uh, West Minnesota or Pelican Rapids uh, or Long Prairie in Central Minnesota is above 25% and maybe more in, in, in some districts is uh, almost 50%. So, um, so what I want to say before we start our conversation tonight, uh, just throwing some numbers, I'm sure that others will uh, jump in and add more to, to these numbers, is that um, the, the, the important story here is that Latino Minnesotans are an integral part of the state. We are part of the state, and so the narratives about Latinos needs to start shifting to embrace our stories that are shaped by immigration. I am a first generation immigrant. So definitely there are uh, those stories that are part of who we are as Latinos in the state. But it's also about new generations and old generations that were born in the US. Uh, so that, that's something that we need to understand uh, when we talk about uh, Latinos and uh, those uh, fast growing uh, demographics. About 80% of Latinos in the state are born in the US or are naturalized. Also take into consideration that 91% of Latino children under 18 are native born. So these new generations, whether the millennials or the alpha generation, uh, those who were born solely in, in the 21st century, are very diverse, some are bilingual, others might not be bilingual, but uh, they are a vital segment of the population. So there is a lot of potential that has been neglected, untapped, or under, underutilized. So we need to start reframing the expectations and opportunities to foster and culti cultivate more teachers, professors, nurses, physicians, scientists, innovators, entrepreneurs, artists, and even politicians. These rapid demographic changes have implications for the state. And if we don't include the Latino experiences in all policies, then we risk to lose an, an, another generation and a chance to create and sustain a quality of life or well-being, well not only for Latinos, but for everyone in the state. So the question for us here tonight, and uh, as we continue this conversation about our uh, communities in the state is, what does quality of life mean? And how do we make sure that everyone attains his or her highest potential? Thank you, Irma. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosita, for providing a, a beautiful overview of our growing um, comunidad, our growing gente here in Minnesota. And I can say that, you know, I am one of those statistics that, you know, was born in Mexico, came to Minnesota when I was just nine years old and grew up in greater Minnesota. And let's not forget um, that we have a, a mighty growing community um, outside of the metro areas as well that is in this moment, keeping a lot of our greater Minnesota cities alive. And so there's so much contribution, so much potential, so much energy to mobilize and, and have investment in our community, you know, long term. As, as you mentioned, we are a very young um, overall uh, population here in the state. And so there's just so much that, that we must, as Minnesotans, do to ensure that um, our community is set up not only to survive, but ultimately to thrive, right? When we think about quality of education, I think of not survival mode. I'm thinking about how does our community ultimately thrive? And so thank you so much, Rosita, for providing that um, you know, overview of who we are here in Minnesota. And I would love to start our conversation today you know, about um, and this is a question I'll, I will start with Rodolfo, but feel free to chime in um, as you see fit. You know, we are almost about two years 
in this um, in the COVID pandemic, um, which has highlighted so much inequalities in all different um, groups of people, um, you know, globally. Um, so, you know, how what what would you say? How is our community doing, um, Rodolfo? And and what do you see from your perspective? I think as things that are you know happening and coming up when it comes to um, the way that COVID has impacted our Latino community here in Minnesota. Gracias, Irma. Thank you, Irma. Eh, hola, buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, uh, almost. And uh, a pleasure to see the Justice page again. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, everybody else here, my colleagues, an honor. Uh, so yeah, uh, just uh, to briefly introduce myself, I am Rodolfo Gutierrez, the Executive Director for Hispanic Advocacy and Community Empowerment Research, ACER. And uh, we are a nonprofit that nonetheless was created by our sister organization, CLUS, long time ago, over 33 years now. But uh, for, since 1997, we are a nonprofit ourselves. And uh, we've been focusing on research and evaluation, but most more, most recently, particularly within the pandemic crisis, uh, we collaborate with uh, MDH closely, uh, with CDC and uh, Foundation and with uh, HERSA in um, trying to determine um, what are the needs from our Latino community in Minnesota and how can we connect them with the resources they might need to navigate this crisis. And as you know, this crisis emerged uh, clearly by March 2020 in the country and uh, very uh, unknown for everybody uh, came up like uh, uh, something we needed to give response immediately, but uh, we didn't know how till recently we do have the vaccine, uh, different vaccines, by the way, but uh, uh, initially it was terrible. And um, this crisis has been, uh, something that uh, is evidencing the differences, the in inequities that are exist in healthcare access for many different groups in, in the state and particularly for the entire country, uh, putting relevance on uh, many issues that are related to healthcare access, but also um, that are uh, talking about more of socioeconomic determinants of health, like uh, access to housing, access to employment, access to school, schooling and all that. So everything came all correlated at the end and showed up that uh, many communities and particularly the Latino communities are way, way behind. But not, not only that, but also uh, there are so many differences within our community labeled as Latino with uh, so many uh, different groups suffering in different ways. Uh, we do have uh, urban communities who are uh, having different, many different uh, issues like uh, when we compare them with um, this, uh, rural communities, particularly those who are in the meatpacking industry or the farming industry, they are apart from everything and not only urban areas, but also services arrivals. Uh, they are very much hiding, hidden and apart from any benefits that may, they might need to reach out. And many of them also are coming out as uh, the most vulnerable populations uh, when we are talking about uh, healthcare, uh, they have not much access. And also they are not entitled to have those accesses because uh, several reasons among them, many of the workers who are there with their families are undocumented uh, in the state. Therefore they have not uh, easy access to services. And also um, so many times and uh, had happened with us uh, when we try to reach out them out in their places of work, uh, they are just uh, under the scrutiny of the employer with, uh, that limits them to having access to any kind of service. Um, this is uh, the context that it is, uh, this is happening under the context of the crisis, but uh, it is not uh, just that, but only the evidence that the problems are there for a long time ago, and they're really, really, really deep. And um, particularly when you think about uh, the insurance uh, access for this population, the percentage of uh, population insured in, in, the, in the state among Latinos is almost the lowest uh, compared with any other ethnic or cultural group. And that said, uh, many of people of Latino Latinos are unprotected. And um, so many times and we went through this, uh, the 
family strategically uh, chooses who, who is the person who's going to be on their insurance coverage because they cannot cover everyone. So they cover either la abuelita, the grandma, or, or the kid who is more vulnerable, or because uh, under condition, someone, the dad or the mom have any conditions, and then they need the insurance. So they are le le leaving the other people, the other members of the family out of the coverage. And that is emerging with the COVID-19 as a big, big problem, and mm -hmm. showing us that we need to really think way beyond the crisis context and try to generate some response that goes for the future and uh, in a time that demographically speaking and i really uh, appreciate a lot the presentation from rosa um we are changing uh, wow. the latino population is the one that's growing faster is uh junk very junk and potentially right. the the one that it's going to be covering uh, uh labor force requirements and particularly special labor force in, in the medicine and the healthcare areas and all that. So yeah, yeah. In this area, in this sense, uh, we need to really focus on what are the inequities that we need to attack. Thank you, Irma. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thank you so much, Rodolfo, for, you know, highlighting some of the ways that our community has been impacted. And, and like you said, you know, this was happening prior to the pandemic and this pandemic has highlighted and, and heightened um, the inequities in a really big way. And just a reminder, right, like, let's be real about um, Latinos in this pandemic uh, nationwide um, remained in the workforce more than any other group. And so our people, documented or not, were really at the front lines and continue to be during mm -hmm. this pandemic, which obviously, um, you know, if you don't have insurance, if you're not, if you don't have a lot of access to resources, that takes a toll on your on your health, you know, talk about like the health um, um, of just like the, the, the impact of COVID in, in, in general, but also like, uh, you know, other type of, of health. And, and <laughs> Ruby, I would love to, you know, hear from you as far as like, what other ways has this pandemic impacted our community? And I know like mental health has been one of the, the bigger ones here as well. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And um, hello, everyone. I, I will probably skip a little bit of the greetings, but a uh, pleasure and honor to be here with all of you. Um, and just know that a lot of my comments will reflect also the work that our tremendous team at Clues, uh, almost 150 staff today, have been doing over the last two years. Um, just by way of context, just want to share for those that don't know, Comunidades Latinas Unidas en Servicio is Minnesota's largest Latino-led nonprofit. It is led because it's it was founded and it continues to operate for Latinos by Latinos. Um, Clues has been in existence in for, for 40 years. We have offices in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and have small offices, um, one person shop in Wilmer in Austin, Minnesota, as we try to provide more services in greater Minnesota. Um, our work has been always focused on the Latino culture, the Latino community. Um, our work is focused on uplifting community development as a whole in a very holistic way, and also trying to advance multi-generations um, or Latinos, whether it's uh, around economic empowerment, health, or um, activating the voices of our community to, attack, you know, to tackle systems change. So we continue to do that work and we are here for the community. A um, couple of the, the things that we certainly have been seeing at Clues um, since the pandemic, um, just tackling health for now, but it, it, probably I'll talk a little bit more about economic empowerment. Um, the, the emotional and health well-being um, of our community certainly has put us um, behind. You know, we are already facing a lot of um, waiting lists and we have licensed professionals who are bilingual, bicultural. Um, and we have recently, just because of a lot of advocacy efforts, we're able to secure uh, federal funding now to advance, to expand our, our reach, our work. Um, the one-in-one -one, um, contact that we had originally with healthcare, for example, all became now through telehealth. And so, you know, we had to reinvent our operations, reinvent our work. Our classrooms became virtual. Our medical services became now um, 
telehealth. But through this particular grant that we received, um, we will be in 2022, we will be able to expand our 14 team member for the clinical services to 40. And so um, currently, as an employer, we're finding ourselves challenged finding Latinos who are licensed, who are, you know, who are um, in that pipeline of providers who are bilingual, bicultural. Um, so as an employer, we are facing some big challenges. As a service provider in the community, we know um, how much work needs to be done and where Minnesota in particular needs to really pick up momentum to provide services in the schools, to provide services, you know, in the communities, in the barrios, in the areas where our people are, um, and just make it available. So we're doing our part as a nonprofit, but it is, um, it's been challenging. And COVID-19 came and brought up, you know, a lot of the, the need to educate our community. They need to change those taboos that we have, of course, um, and all of us, um, you know, adults and young people and elders, um, you know, that's another community, the elder Latino community that we all need to figure out how to, how do we continue as a community in community development? How do we continue to not leave them out of the, of the spectrum? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruby, for you know, sharing not only how the pandemic has impacted our community directly, but in many ways how it impacts and has impacted many of the Latino organizations across the state, um, especially in the way that we serve um, our, our, our different communities. Um, so thank you so much for going into detail about that one. Um, and and you, you kind of actually um, mentioned something in, along the lines of, you know, our economic power um, also during this pandemic. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, Latinos were in many ways like the, the engines that continue to keep this economy, you know, going throughout the U.S. And so um, this question, again, is for um, anyone that would love to jump in. But when we think about our economic well-being, um, Latinos, as you know, are disproportionately represented in low in income or low wage labor force in our state. Um, what has been the impact of pandemic on our community's economic security overall? Sure, if I can jump in really quick. Um, Latinos have the highest labor force in the state, higher even than the white counterpart. So um, Latinos have, you know, when we look at narratives, Latinos have, Latino workers in particular, have the highest labor force, but then they have the lowest, in, one of the lowest incomes. So you can right away see and assess the disparities. Um, so we have been working on that um, by providing a clue, certainly um, kind of a continuum of, of service that helps welcome people in whatever moment in life they are and people come to clues through different doors of opportunity. But our model is to move people from economic instability, help them to get to economic stability. You know, whether people have lost a job or have lost a home or have, you know, had a health issue that has moved them from stable to unstable, all these, um, environmental pieces that, that, that um, Rodolfo talked a little bit about with the social determinants of health have an impact on the economy of a family and the survival mode. So our model of work is moving people from instability to stability. And we were working um, before COVID to move people from stability to economic mobility. That's where we were you know, really looking at where, where do we wanna help our community as a whole and in a multi-generational way, advanced um, our community development. Um, sadly, you know, with the, the loss of work, um, while the service providers in the Latino community were at the forefront of, um, you know, in a very resilient way, um, they were at the front line of providing these services. And we all have read the stories of, you know, the meatpacking companies and the the workers and, but a lot of them were also, you know, after 20 years working at a hotel, for example, and they, they were very stable financially, they became unstable. So um, as a community and, and certainly clues as an organization, like some of my colleagues as well, we had to connect people to opportunities. 
um, there are many narratives that that there are some assumptions, right? That Latinos are all immigrants or Latinos are this or that, or they're great workers, but that's where we, I think some of the inequities um, really showed up even in a, in a greater way um, as Latinos work very hard and they, you know, they have this reputation of being loyal and employers come to clues to seek partnerships. Um, but the numbers in Minnesota, I think that the piece of finding workers has become something that um, it's kind of getting out of, out of hand. Um, I personally get a lot of calls from employers who say, I have 250 vacancies, how can you help us? Um, or, you know, we love working with Latino employees, but how do we fill in at my factory? Uh, you know, 300 positions. These are big, big, projects and in, in areas of work that need to be assessed um, by the by everyone you know with public and private partnerships become effective and I, I do I always say how community as a whole whether it's institutions like Federal Reserve Bank or you know or state agencies and government or private in um, organizations, Nonprofits that are on the ground that are for and by those communities have some answers and we have some solutions and we have to every day figure out how can we be then part of the change um, that we need to have. So Latinos for the most part have that reputation, um, but we also need to think as a community about the economic right. um, prosperity piece, right? We're trying to move people, not just through stability, but also what are those assets? And we have a model of operation um, that is focusing on, you know, assessing a job as an asset, a job that pays good fees, good wages, um, a job that supports people in learning English because we want to mm -hmm. build career opportunities. Um, you know, whether it's uh, not just building a home, you know, it's, it's one of the ways, but building those assets for people to have work mobility. Um, financial mobility, um, and that's, again, multi-generationally for youth. So I'll make some comments later on about young people and how it is our job to figure out how do we, as a community, invest in our young population. They are not the future, but the current workers <laughs> of tomorrow, right. and um, we need to invest more in, in making those financial prosperity pieces. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead, Aline, please. Oh, no, it's okay. I, I'm Aline Shurmoff. I'm the Senior Vice President of Community Development, as Irba mentioned when um, we started this conversation. And I, I think, Rosa, or Ruby, you just mentioned something that I think is really important is that, you know, there's a lot of answers that we can have, we can hear and understand through community organizations, people who are working with um, with members of the Latino community across the state in a way that I think is helpful for us to, to be able to understand. You know, I, I could take a step back for a second and say, why would the Fed be interested in this? I mean, I think maybe maybe some of you know, but when um, you know Congress created the Federal Reserve System as kind of a decentralized model where we have um, 12 reserve banks around the country that are really supposed to be representing the economic conditions of our districts and for uh, for Minnesota or for the Minneapolis Fed, we're Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Northwest Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And so, really, when Congress was creating it, they wanted to us the voices uh, to be dispersed around the country to have that representation. And then, you know, later they gave us a, a dual mandate, a responsibility for us to understand and manage kind of uh, inflation, which I think is the way that a lot of people know the Fed is through our monetary policy decisions, but also uh, maximum employment. And so when Ruby, you're talking about, and Rosa, you mentioned this earlier as well, in terms of the demographics of the state, in terms of the labor force participation, it's really helpful for us to be able to kind of hear and understand what current conditions are and um, you know how people are, um, how people are faring and, and how people are experiencing the economy. And I can just share, you know, kind of broadly in the past year, we at the Minneapolis Fed, um, as, as, along with our colleagues across the system, actually launched a series on the role of structural racism and the implications on the US economy. So looking at it, not only from a historical perspective, but also trying to advance potential policy solutions that could interrupt 
systems, systems of racism or systems of things where we see disparate outcomes across communities. Um, and I think that you know some of the things that we were you were just talking about in terms of disparities in in, um, in income and as well as educational um, outcomes, I think are really persistent in the data as we look at impacts to Hispanic and Latino communities. And that has really big implications on the future of our state. As we think about if the community is growing, if communities of color in particular are growing and continue to grow um, and we leave people behind, that is gonna impact the overall vitality and the long-term vitality of the state. So I, I just really wanted to say, I really appreciate what you're saying. And I, those comments really resonate with me from my perspective at the Fed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen, for that. And I think one of the common threads, right, is, is investment, right? When we think about what our communities need is, is investment. It's, and it's not forget that, you know, Latinos already contribute so much to the economy, not only with, um, you know, our, our labor force, intelligence, and then, you know, intellect, but as far as, you know, our buying power. Um, in 1990, um, Latinos buying power um, was about 213 million. Um, that rose in the in the in the last decade, and we are expected to be um, buying power of 1.9 uh, trillion in 2023. So that is in two years from now. Um, and and yet, right, like we are not seeing those dollars come to our community often. Just in philanthropy alone, as you know, a, a lot of us currently in this in this conversation are are leading nonprofit organizations. Well, in philanthropy. Nationwide, only 1.1% of philanthropic dollars um, actually uh, support Latinx uh, direct service or Latinx led nonprofit organizations, and that is across the US. And so like we are seeing a lot of how our community invests and, and, and has that um, buying power in the US, yet that money is not being trickled down to um, our community. Um, unfortunately, so that is really one of the things you know that I'm that I'm hearing from this conversation, and and the, just like the need of of ensuring that is um, that that we are as a community invested invested in for the long term, not only for us as Latinos, but for the well being of our country in general and 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 our state. Uh, you know, I would love to maybe shift gears a little bit. I think when we think about the future, when we think about the possibilities and the potential and the fact that the majority of Latinos in the U.S. and in Minnesota um, are, are, are young in age, um, I want to shift to, you know, one of the probably most powerful strategies to ensure that there is um, equity in all communities is, is education. And so I would love to hear from, you know, Justice Page about, you know, how do you, how do you see our Latinx community um, advancing in this state? What are some um, experiences and numbers that you can share when it comes to um, the education of a Latino students? Well, thank you for uh having me and letting me share some thoughts with you. Let me just begin by saying that the Latino community has been devastated. Indeed, children generally, but particular children from communities of color have been decimated by this pandemic. The, um, for 2020, uh, the reading scores, the math scores at grade level have dropped dramatically to the point and, and dropped, actually dropped dramatically overall for everybody, but for communities of color, including Latino communities, uh, the, the, the drops have been precipitous to the point that I think somewhere in the high 20s, low 30% of children are reading and doing math at grade level. Think about that. Just think about that. What does that bode for the future? I mean, we have concerns about what's going on today, but looking down the road, uh, if we're leaving children behind at that rate, um, it is unsustainable for the state of Minnesota, particularly given the growth, uh, as you noted, 
in the Latino community, uh, going from, what was it, roughly 300,000 to 500 plus thousand in a relatively short period of time. Think about 20% of those 200,000 people that grow in, in the growth category being left behind. Um, and when I, 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 I say being left behind, you know, the children that are in school today are going to be tomorrow's consumers, tomorrow's employees, tomorrow's taxpayers, tomorrow's community leaders. And to the extent that only 20% of them or 20, we'll just you'd say 30% of them are performing at grade level today. Um, we, 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 we can't survive that way. Um, and that the, in conjunction with uh, Neil Kashkari, the president of the Minneapolis Fed, um, we've come up with a, a plan to change that so that uh, we don't leave any children behind. Indeed, I was talking about the differences uh, today, the 2020, things weren't all that great in uh, 2019 or before. There were disparities between uh, the communities of color, including the Latino community and their white peers, their middle-class uh, white peers. We've got a a, eliminate those disparities, but B, and more importantly, start educating children in a way that meets them where they are so that every child has the opportunity to learn. We've developed a proposal which would amend Minnesota's constitution to do just that, so that education would become a civil right. Currently, the Minnesota Constitution's education clause focuses on the system itself, doesn't focus on children. We have the opportunity, I think, to shift the focus to include children, making education, as I say, a civil right. You know, when I talk about education, I'm talking about public education. Um, right now, as I mentioned, the, the Constitution focuses on the system and what children are entitled to is an adequate system, not an adequate education, but an ad adequate system of education. We would make education a civil right for all children, a quality public education, a civil right, uh, and defining quality would include uh, preparing, fully preparing children for participation in our economy, our democracy, and our society. So that they, all children, would become um, full members of who we are as a society. Our co constitutional proposal would create accountability for the system to ensure that the system was performing. It would um, make education a paramount duty of the state, which would be the highest obligation the state would have. Now, sure, there are other things in the state government that may be as important, but nothing would be more important. And it would ensure that um, education would become individualized so that individual children would be receiving an education that would allow them to reach their fullest potential. And so, so that whatever their hopes and dreams were for the future, they would be in a position to achieve. Yeah. And quite frankly, we're, it's about time that, that, that we start educating children with an eye towards educating individuals yeah. and meeting children where they are. Mm -hmm. That's something that we haven't been doing. And finally, I would just note that as with the Page Education Foundation, and thank you, Irma, 
for all that you have done uh, to ensure that those following in your footsteps have opportunity uh, because that's what we do at the foundation. This pandemic has, has uh, been a real challenge for our paid scholars. And I don't have the exact number, but somewhere between um, I think 15 and 20% of our paid scholars are Latino or from the Latino community. And, um, you know, we, our numbers are down from the number that we serve because of the pandemic. Um, but those who have been able to stick with us and we continue to support, um, they're changing the future as you have done. And uh, we're pretty excited about what their potential is. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Justice Page, for you know sharing your insights about um, the importance of education. And, and you know, I think we can generalize and really say that um, education always continues to be the number one of the number one, if not top five, um, uh, issues that our community is is truly um, invested in. Right, like I can say that one of the reasons why my parents um, came to the U.S. about 22 years ago was for better opportunities, but also for the opportunities that education really had to offer. Um, for for my brother and I, and so you know, I think education is is crucial. I think parents um, are oftentimes, you know, one of the one of the examples of how the pandemic has impacted um, education in our Latino community is is by not having um, folks that can really communicate with our families, um, and therefore leaving our students out and leaving our families out from um, our education system completely. Just last year at Latino Lead, um, our education Education action team um, successfully, um, you know, organized to try to ensure that there was more ELL English language learning funding um, for within our districts and within our schools. And for the first time in about 15 years, um, that in that funding increased. And in you know, 15 years, it had been you know stagnant. And when our communities and and this is immigrant communities, not only Latinx communities, but our, we know that our community and immigrant community have been on the rise in our state, yet um, our systems have not kept up with that um, mm -hmm. to this point. And so thank you so much for, you know, um, uh, having this be uh, a civil rights, um, uh, you know, uh, right for every student um, to have a quality education. And so I want to- can I, can I just chime in with, with one, one thing? Um, I've had the good fortune to have a relationship with a, a middle school in Minneapolis, Justice Page Middle School. And one of the things that excites me no end is the number of teachers, not uh, language teachers, the art teacher, the social studies teacher, the math teacher. When I visit the school and visit the classroom and hear them talking with students in their language, whether it be uh, Spanish or um, uh, you know Eritrean or whatever, it, it, it's 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 almost beyond belief that um, we haven't been doing that all along. That we ha haven't put teachers in place who can communicate with the students in a way that they can relate to. And so there's hope out there. Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about what goes on in Justice Page. Yes, thank you. And I know, you know, I want to stay in education as it's a really important topic. Um, Ruby, um, you know, you were about to also share some thoughts. And again, the question is, how well is the education system in Minnesota meeting Latino, Latino children's needs? Yeah, and I, I uh, thank you for giving me the, the podium here, but um, just wanted to highlight the huge challenges that our college students are facing. Um, we work with a number of students and um, I keep hearing more than once, you know, the, the impact that COVID and even before that um, 
in the prosperity pathway, let's say, COVID had because the financial burden that they were already facing, um, and, and we know that this is a system that needs to be updated and, and upgraded. Um, but overall with COVID, I think our students um, felt the, or had not felt that they had the responsibility to help their families financially. A lot of their parents lost their jobs. Um, you know, a lot of our students still, because of, you know, they, they're dreamers, they have not been able to have a solid, stable pathway to, to um, wealth building, to achieve higher education. So we're seeing appalling numbers in very low rates of not only attainment of higher education, but even enrolling, enrollment um, has gone down. Um, so the student debt, uh, while we, you know, I, I appreciate the framing of this is a human right issue, I, which I agree with. Um, as we look at, at this, this is a way to empower, um, you know, the changing narratives that as a community and with everyone else that is not Latino that we need to keep building is the investment on Latino youth is critical. It's critical to the economy of Minnesota. It's critical to the United States. Um, and it's not just to frame our young people as workers or the future workers, which I would say that I work very hard on that, but it is about wealth building. You know, how can they become the owners? How can they have the human right to not only achieve education, but also achieve economic mobility and economic prosperity? They are the future. There's no denying with the demographic numbers. We hear it everywhere across the country and locally, um, how we need to create ladders that can help this mobility faster for our young people is up to us. The impact and the, the financial burden for our young people has an impact on the wealth building of our community as a Latino community locally and na nationally. And so it is, it is just critical that we figure out how do we eliminate barriers? How do we incorporate um, students? A lot of the funding from the feds comes through the higher education institutions. I have many students that are enrolling in college or universities with a four-year degree, but they don't feel the sense of belonging. They feel disconnected. Other students that have graduated are being stolen by states like you know uh, Georgia and other states. They're moving now. As an employer, I try to attract young people right after they graduate from college. And this year alone, I lost two great candidates that I really, really was ready to hire, and they were stolen immediately um, by other states. So we need to pay attention to that and the investment needs to be holistic, not just as workers, but also um, as part of the contributors to the economic system and the well-being system and the wealth of the state of Minnesota because otherwise we're gonna lose. I like to say that education justice is linked to housing justice, to economic justice is linked to health justice and you know creating that wealth there is an inextricable link between that and ensuring that um, our young people have opportunity puts them in the position to be successful at whatever their future may hold and um, as, as we've said any number of times here this afternoon, we're on an unsustainable path. We cannot continue going down this road from a, a social justice standpoint, from an economic justice standpoint, from a racial justice standpoint. We just can't continue to do it. I wanted to jump in, but I see Rodolfo has his hand up as well. So I don't know, you have <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I was waiting for me to be named. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna so I'm gonna be really brief. Uh, sorry about that. But it's yeah, um, I just uh, it caught my attention the questions that we were pointing out too, because uh, I guess it talks about uh, barriers and all that. And uh, you can talk about the experience you go through depending on where you are living in the neighborhood determines too much. What are you going to be your experiences? But also, I guess uh, when you go through elementary school, 
to middle school, even to high school, you have different kind of barriers than when you are going to college. And uh, the system is not well connected to you to for, for you to follow up properly with the correct advices. And we did a study on opportunities and challenges for Latino students in Minnesota. And we found out that there are several programs like uh, Torch in, in Northfield. They do follow up with students from the beginning, the moment they incorporate themselves into schools, elementary schools, till they go to college. And they help people to have scholarships and uh, admission in colleges and all that. And th that is a successful story I think we need to look at in order for us to really reshape the system that just let the kids out from uh, any support after they finish uh, either elementary school or middle school, and then let them alone uh, by themselves to confront even uh, bad advices. I remember one of, uh, of our students in the study we did on uh, segregation at schools. Uh, he was advised that uh, he needed to study just a two-year college program because uh, he was not going to have any other resources or any other capacity to deliver any results in four or five years uh, programs. So he better go to college and study two years and that's it. That is wrong. That is wrong. They are just limiting the ambitions and the desires and the capacities of students. So the system has to change and be more integral from the beginning to the end. And that is all what I wanted to say. Thank you. I, I wanted to just jump in as well with some numbers because Justice Page was talking about them. And I think it's kind of helpful and in some ways some stunning to hear and see. So for example, um, you know, 44% of all Minnesota children were proficient in math in 2021 but only 21% of Latino students were. 53% um, of Minnesota children were proficient in reading in 2021, and only 31% of Latino students were. And we could kind of go through all of these statistics and see the different outcomes. I mean, I will say 44% um, of children being proficient in math in 2021 also isn't a number to be super proud about. There, that's, there's a lot of people that, that means that aren't proficient in math on the other side of that equation. Um, but really 21% in, in 2021. And that those are kind of that, that's data that's coming from the Minnesota Department of Education. So I think Rosa talked about this in the beginning. Justice Page and I just a couple of weeks ago were up in Pelican Rapids um, and we had the opportunity to visit a school where you know over 50% of the students were Latino. And it's we we're really looking at this as not just an urban issue. Some people might think. This is an urban issue that we're talking about students of color, but it's actually urban and rural. Um, and it's not just kids of color, it's also poor, poor white children, poor students. And so if we're really looking at an education system that's setting up the, uh, the foundation and the infrastructure for the next generation of, of all of us workers, and if we, for people to really kind of fulfill their own uh, their own destiny or the, their live their best lives. It's we're really ultimately um, in a perilous position, I think, at this moment, and that's why the Minneapolis Fed has been partnering so closely with Justice Page about trying to reshape the conversation to really provide that the amendment to the Constitution as a civil right, um, and that really just changes the foundation. Sometimes I think about this because some people I may, might know that I used to do a lot of uh, work in infrastructure. So I worked at the Metropolitan Council. And when I think about when you build something, the foundation of whatever you build on top of it will ultimately determine whether or not that structure is straight and whether or not that structure can stand on its own. And so the constitution in that way is kind of a foundational document. And that if it's if we have a, a, have a document that is written for adequacy and we have a document that's written actually a slave era document that's written for white landowner children, um, we're producing those outcomes and it's gonna be impossible to shape, to reshape those outcomes without going back to the foundation. And that's ultimately the constitution. So I think um, obviously it's an important concept, especially as we think about that the next generation of workforce. Yeah, so what I wanted to add to those numbers, Aline, is that, uh, yeah, about 20% uh, of the Minnesota population is a BIPOC population, communities of color, indigenous. Uh, but uh, about 34, 35% of the student body in Minnesota is BIPOC, so people of color, students of color. And only 4% are teachers of color. 
So that's something that uh, we also need to put into the uh, equation here uh, for plenty of studies show that uh, educational outcomes and success in education is very much tied with uh, the teachers and uh, the teachers that um, look like these students and so how they can relate to their own experiences as black students as latino students as asian american students indigenous students so i think that um that's also very important to take into consideration how we can invest more uh, definitely to uh, improve the educational outcomes of kids and their experiences in school and that sense of belonging and respecting their schools in increasing teachers of color in Minnesota. And that's something that uh, our council and the two other ethnic councils for the state of Minnesota and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and a large coalition under the umbrella of the Coalition of Teachers of Color has been working very hard in the last uh, uh, six years. And it has uh, proven uh, uh, the, the, the legislative work around it uh, uh, has uh, more and more momentum because everybody realizes how important it is to also increase teachers of colors in the school. So in addition to other um, systems changes like the ones that um, Justice Page was referring to, including making sure that kids uh, live in a stable house, in a house that uh, uh, has uh, that is affordable for the parents to acquire, um, that kids have access to healthcare, that kids even have access to dental hygiene. The, all of these elements, everything is connected and all of these systems are um, need to work uh, together so that uh, kids, when they go to school, they are well nourished, they have good health, they come from stable houses and their mental health and other uh, essential needs for these kids are also met. So I think that it's a combination of many uh, policies working all together. Uh, even just talking with uh, some folks in Red Wing uh, in August, because we had this, uh, we visit different uh, communities in Greater Minnesota. We've been doing that since 2017 and we have had the chance to talk uh, with many, many families and Latino individuals in across Minnesota. And one thing that for them is part of their mental health and their uh, stability and peace of mind, you won't believe, but is that uh, they have uh, a driver's license. Just that piece of ID and identification so that the kids, uh, that the parents can go to work safely, that the the parents can uh, bring their kids to the school or to the clinic. That's just that is important for them. And so there are many other factors interconnected. And I think that when we look at all of those, I think that that's when we can think of uh, this blueprint for equity in the Latino community, which encompasses then uh, the, a path for their lifelong learning, uh, well-being and health, a sense of belonging and prosperity. So we need to think of all the system, all integrate together and investing with equity in the communities that need it the most. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Rosa, Justice Page, um, uh, Elaine, and also Rodolfo. I want to um, make sure that I am also reading some of the um, questions. I, obviously, this is a really important topic for folks um, joining us today, and I just want to um, you know, ask, um, we have uh, folks asking, you know, what does the, an ideal education system look like and feel like for, uh, for Latinos in the state, uh, which I think we have talked a little bit more about that. And Rosita, you mentioned a little bit of the importance of having teachers really representing and looking like the student demographic is, is to be important in addition to, you know, of course, driver's licenses. Um, so keeping that in mind as we're thinking about, um, you know, what, what an ideal education system looks like for Latinos. And the other question, kind of like a follow up to that is, you know, what are some of the more specific barriers that Latinos are facing when trying to get an education? And that, you know, Ruby, I don't know if you want to maybe start with answering some of that, which I think, you know, kind of uh, touches into, you know, your view of this as a holistic approach. Yeah, I think definitely there's not one solution. Um, this problem has been happening in Minnesota for the longest time where Latinos have the lowest achievement, particularly in Minneapolis. 
Um, I think we as Latino community, I don't want to say leaders, but community people who have engaged in trying to make a difference have tried to address systems at a, at a you know, school district level. Um, I think this needs to be a, a holistic approach more from the Department of Education. Um, and when I say holistic means not only, you know, it needs to be from pre-K all the way to 16, um, you know, not, not just uh, K through 12, but all the way to the four years of education. The, the system right now is too broken into pieces and people are observing different achievements. Um, but knowing where we're going, you know, all the pieces that Rosa mentioned that you mentioned regarding, you know, the teachers of color. So people, it is a sense of belonging. If you look for what is at the center, if the system would define how to support Latino students to improve in their achievement, it needs to incorporate culture, it needs to incorporate family supports, it needs to incorporate, uh, you know, community supports. Because um, just throwing more money at the problem or talking about the problem, I'm literally tired of observing the problem, observing the statistics. And we have to start, and, and it really starts with government. I'm a taxpayer, so I have a demand of my <laughs> government to invest in our children. Um, there's huge disinvestment in um, ESL, you mentioned ELL, but adult learners, there has been no change for adult learners of English. I can tell you from my experience working at CLUES, this summer we had 200 people enroll in ESL. And we get probably 20 cents on a dollar of what we need to invest in terms of staff to cover this. So Latinos want to be engaged, Latinos want to learn um, and these are the parents of those children that have the impact. Um, their complexity in attending school, you know, while some children have the benefit of going home and doing homework, having a nice snack. A lot of our Latino children are, are in high poverty. They have to take care of their siblings so parents can go to work at night. They have to, you know, do other chores in the house to support the parents, or they have to work when they're in college. They have to be the supporters financially because parents can't have a job. So complex issues that one silver bullet's not going to fix. Um, and sometimes even just like I said earlier for higher education, having a scholarship, um, which some students that I have talked to have, and they still quit because they don't feel the sense of belonging in that university. Um, so those are things we need to pay attention to, and it is one person at a time, but holistic approaches, in my view, need to happen. Um, and so um, I'm sure others probably have other ideas, but systems need to be changed. We need to look at how the education system is so broken and how do we put Latino students at the center and what are the systems that can help impact those across the state, not just metro area? The system is broken and we can't continue to try to fix it by tinkering here and tinkering there and getting the same result. And well, I can't, you know, I'm not an educator, so I don't know the, the detailed specifics, but I do understand this. If you educate individual children, give individual children what they need, and it'll be different for rural children, it'll be different for urban children, different for suburb, suburban children. It'll be different for Latino children, maybe, for indigenous children, for um, Asian children or African children. Maybe different for all of them. Indeed, it will be because individuals, if we educate individual children so that the child gets what he or she needs to grow and develop, we can make a difference. Doing what we could, we've done for the last 160 plus years um, is simply not going to produce any results different than what we've got today. 
Indeed, uh, as you noted, we talk a lot about it, uh, but when all is said and done, more is said than done. It's time we start doing something. Thank you. Thank you so much again, um, Ruby and, and um, Justice Page for sharing your thoughts. And, and I think, you know, it, it goes back to, um, let's not forget the fact that um, Latino, Latinx or Latino students in general bring um, you know, so much money into the state when it comes to our education system that we need to ensure that um, the representatives in those districts, specifically in greater Minnesota, as I said in the beginning, you know, that's where I grew up. I grew up in a, in a county that was uh, very, um, you know, uh, like really against changing and, and updating the way that it had always worked. Once and, and now in, in St. James, Minnesota, over 50% of the students in the elementary school are Latino. Um, and you cannot tell me that the funding that is coming into that uh, city um, shouldn't go to our Latino families and students. That is the right thing to do. That is what we must do. And we need to remind the representatives about the importance of having, um, you know, investing in those communities. Otherwise, we need to boot them out. Um, if they're not serving the communities that they represent, um, ultimately they are harming the prosperity of our, um, of our state in general. And so it's also one of those things where everything is um, interconnected. But I think when I think about um, you know, change, I think about how do you um, change the, the you know, lawmakers and the representatives and senators in our, in our different districts to ensure that they're thinking about the Latino community in big ways. And so there's a lot to do. Um, and I know that I wanna make sure that we are getting to um, other questions as well. Um, and so I'm gonna shift us a little bit and, and talk about you know, um, uh, the policy. Um, as I was, you know, sharing, you know, what the importance of our, are those that represent us and how well they represent us. Um, th in this question, I would love for Rosa to begin um, by sharing your initial thoughts and please feel free to jump in for the rest of you. Um, what is the impact of national policy on our own Latino community? Well, that's a pretty uh, difficult question since uh, things, uh, uh, in Washington, as you know, pretty much like here in Minnesota, uh, right now, uh, everything that is uh, policy related in Congress um, is uh, very slow in moving. But I think that uh, as we were talking about uh, how um, uh, how we can better invest and make sure that um, Latinos and our students and our families can thrive, um, there's the um, Build Back Better, uh, bill that is uh, right now in Congress being uh, debated. And uh, this has uh, uh, all of the ingredients and uh, many of the solutions that we were talking about uh, today. Uh, for instance, uh, the package would include uh, universal and free preschool. Uh, for uh, three and four year olds, you know. Um, it would make investments in childcare. It would deliver affordable, high quality care for older Americans, et cetera. So I think that there is a path there, but the question always remains to which extent uh, that big investment that might come or might not come because uh, as I said, it's debated and uh, there's uh, still opposition in, in the Senate. Uh, it's even if uh, the, the bill passes and is authorized and it becomes, becomes the law of the land, like uh, the infrastructure and jobs that just passed, to which extent do we make sure that that investment is equitable and that it also uh, uh, includes uh, our communities and regardless of immigration status, because that's the other thing. Uh, in that same um, bill and in the whole conversation uh, in the nation, the, the, the advocates and the advocates uh, uh, pro immigrant uh, rights advocates would speak to that matter much better than me because they are more involved than us because we work at the state level, not at the federal level in regards to immigration is um, whether or not there's gonna be uh, a path uh, for uh, citizenship or at least for uh, granting uh, uh, permits authorization for people who don't have documents right now to work. And as long as that doesn't pass, we don't know to which extent this investment will also go 
to those uh, mixed families, uh, sorry, to these families with mixed uh, immigration status or those uh, who are not uh, US citizens or those who are undocumented. So there's always this big question and that trickled down, <laughs> trickles down to the state and then to the local uh, governments as, uh, as well, the municipalities and the counties, etc. So we have, um, we have, a, uh, we have some challenges still there, but there is at least one path where we can say, okay, so there's gonna be some investments at the federal level, but the question always remains to which extent it is going to be equitable. And then at the state level, as we know, there is a surplus in the budget that has been announced uh, very recently this week uh, by, uh, the, um, by Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. So there is this uh, surplus of, $7.7 .7 billion, that's a lot of money. Uh, and again, uh, yeah, we need to make sure that uh, some of that money goes to the reserves of the state. And I think that they have made the calculations. And even with that, there's still a lot of money there, so, uh, at least $7.1 billion, in addition to the um, uh, American uh, Rescue Plan that also has another $1.5 or $1.2 Point five million billion dollars. So there's there's money in the coffers of the state, and we need to make sure that that uh, goes uh, is invested equitable. And I think that that's where um, the community and organizations and any others have a chance right now to say how do they want this uh, budget to be invested in our communities and low income families in Minnesota. And if I just can add, like, I totally agree with you, Rosa, but also I guess it's part of our duties and our homework to promote civic participation from our communities. Uh, thus far, uh, the lowest participation in electoral processes and uh, even in local levels are coming out from Latinos. The Latinos are not very well motivated to go to the uh, voting lines and we need to promote more and also engagement from people. Uh, I am really glad to see uh, Maria Isa is uh, moving forward and created her uh, campaign for the Senate, but we need, need more. Uh, we, we are enough Latinos to have more representatives there for us to really push forward and say, we need more equitable distribution of these uh, uh, benefits that are there in money, in, uh, in all infrastructure and everything. So we need to promote more participation from Latinos as well. You want me to jump in? Um, for me, I think, uh, yes, ditto to what my esteemed colleagues said. And I will add that if we have high hopes for Minnesota's workforce um, population, which Latinos are at the top of that labor force to help impact Minnesota's economy going forward, we, we have to be in economic recovery. That's what we are, right? So. This BBB funding from the feds is to help us get back to, to where we need to be back on track. Um, Minnesota already was facing a lot of disparities that have grown. And so um, I'm gonna talk a couple of talking points around workforce. So retooling, reskilling our current workers um, in the Latino community, that's key to helping our folks earn better wages, um, attain jobs that pay benefits, because there's been a huge disparity and, and racist disparity, I will say, where Latinos have some of the highest labor force, but they're working two, three jobs just to make ends meet. So uh, securing better jobs for our people will take some investment in education, um, starting with ESL, starting with attaining a GED, starting with you know, hands-on reskilling and retooling um, and partnerships with community-based programs, solutions, nonprofits. Um, I know at CLUES we have been, been doing that and we typically in, in the state level get this, this wall that says, well, we're not here to fund nonprofits. Well, we have to come up with better solutions than what you have been doing for the last 30 years. So, Indeed, you know, through the legislature, we have been able to attain some funding to, to do some initiatives led for and by community. Not enough, not enough. Um, and so we need to really invest some of that money. And the state has $7 billion. You know, we don't have to wait for CARES, but the money's coming. 
So um, we have to get ready for that and figure out how do we get our community up there, including our young people. For our young people, I think policies that help us figure out not only the current debt that higher education has for them, because that's um, a huge um, burden on them, as well as prevents them from thinking about building wealth. Um, but you know, I think that frame, um, that framework, we need to advance more about our communities of color, uh, BIPAC communities, Latinos uh, specifically building wealth. It's critical ownership um, of our, you know, Latino businesses. How many, you know, how many Latino businesses help build Lake Street? In the last 40 years I lived in Minnesota, I saw that renaissance. But at the same time, in the last decade, I saw all those businesses leave Lake Street because they didn't own the property. So there's, there's a disconnect there as to what we hope to aspire, but then the activities that we do are not matching. So we need to be very intentional about that. Um, and investing again in child, you know, if we want to get workers back to work, um, our Latino community and our parents have the least access to scholarships for early childhood programs. A lot of our work is done kind of underground or, you know, by friends and family members because culture needs to be addressed. And it's so expensive. So workers cannot go back to work if there's no housing support, if there's no childcare support, and if the wages continue to be so low and the expenses so high. So that's when I when I talk about holistic approaches, it's all of the above. Um, and I think the state needs to invest in support services for parents and working parents who need those supports like housing and healthcare and um, you know, access to affordable childcare so that they can get back to work in a system that would allow them to not only become stable, but have the ability to build mobility, economic mobility at some point. So that's what we're working toward. There are ways to do it. And if we need to continue to present our own bills, um, just to continue to fund it as a community, we will do so. But it is the state that needs to figure out what's their response to the Latino community because we are the fastest growing group. And so we need to keep carving space for our voice to be at the table and at the decision-making table. Yes, thank you. And, and we need to do it in a bold, unapologetic way, um, which is really the, the way to go in order for us to be loud and bold about the needs and wants and, and, and really truly what our community deserves. Um, you know, I think in, in throughout this conversation, we've talked a, a lot about, you know, the, um, you know, some celebrations, some challenges um, that we have as a Latino community, um, some opportunities, of course, as well. And I think one of the common denominators here is, you know, at the center of this, the, the biggest impact is, is racism and discrimination. And so, you know, the, the question for all of you is, what is the impact of, of racism on, on our community? And I'd I love to kick it off at first for um, Rodolfo to maybe share some initial thoughts here. Yeah, thank you, Irma. Uh, racism is kind of an issue we uh, avoid to discuss among Latino communities quite often because it has uh, several dimensions. It's only it's not only uh, that we see racism coming from the mainstream, so to speak, population in in the states, but also uh, within our own groups, we uh, see racism executed against ourselves as Latinos. Uh, we uh, are have to talk about that. We really avoid uh, confronting that issue. And also we've been receiving kind of information that it's being processed in many different ways. Uh, we did a study on uh, segregation at schools. And when we asked about racism uh, to uh, black African-American students in uh, high school and Latino students in high school, the responses were pretty much uh, synthesized by uh, African-Americans uh, talking about the history of oppression, history of repression, history of discrimination and separation and everything were very well documented in, in general. While Latinos said uh, the discrimination, the racism was abolished with the slavery in the United States. And that affected only, and if it affects still 
uh, only the black population, that it is not affecting Latino communities, but it's, it is something in the past. And that, uh, when we ask them, is something that, that, that they learned in the schools. In the same high school, they were going with peers from African-American ascendants. They were learning that and they were processing it differently. Then we asked about discrimination and they suffered a lot of discrimination. They complain about discrimination, but they cannot call it racism. And also that is a big problem because uh, conceptually speaking, uh, being Latino is uh, an ethnic identification. It's not a racial identification. And then it's kind of difficult for people to really understand what it is uh, being discriminated for being Latino. Or, or being um, different for being Latino because within ourselves, as I said before, we do have, we encompass all, all the races as well. Our uh, brothers and sisters who are, are Latino, Afro-Latinos are here in a very hard situation. They are not fully identified themselves as Latinos because the Latino community are not fully uh, incorporating them, but they cannot either uh, identify themselves as uh, Afro-American because they are not born in the United States. So those problems are uh, arising now. And I think racism is a very complicated issue that we need to uh, talk about more among uh, Latinos and particularly among leaders who are engaged in uh, looking for justice and uh, equity. And we need to bring up with uh, some kind of um, understanding of how complex it is uh, to see our communities being so different, but also labeled under this concept. I remember also some uh, elements that are pointing to the language as element for being discriminated. And language is not race, but it is another identification. However, it serves for the community to be in that position. And that makes another or adds another layer of difficulty to talk about racism because it's not uh, that simple. So uh, I wanted to point it out uh, because uh, when we try to study this, it's quite complicated. And I know uh, Rosa and, and Ruby and um, here everybody can say something else, but yeah, I want to just to establish this kind of uh, element. We need to talk more about that and we are avoiding it with our, within our communities. Yeah, no, thank you, um, Rodolfo, for, for sharing that. And I think, um, you know, there is this, um, you know, there is um, an opportunity for our own community to have these internal conversations about how we as Latinos perpetuate um, racism within ourselves and, and within other groups. And at the same time, there is this really um, critical piece of, you know, we don't have statistics when it comes to the impact of racism um, for the Latino community, but we we see those examples um, throughout. One really quick example, you know, the, the question is what is the impact um, of racism in the Latino community? It is, as within any community, I would say it's a life and death, um, you know, consequence and situation. Just about two weeks ago, um, the police officer, Aaron Klaus, was not charged um, with the murder of and, and shooting of Ricardo Torres Jr. in Olivia, uh, Minnesota, a, a rural town here in our state. There wasn't a lot of conversations about it. There wasn't a lot of noise about it. And um, it was well um, noted by that community that there was, uh, that, that since Latinos have arrived um, in greater Minnesota cities, um, that there has been a heightened of racist acts against our communities. And I lived that throughout, you know, St. James of, you know, doing a protest for um, uh, Dia del Inmigrante and having Confederate flags um, just driving through our, our peaceful protests. And so like, it is a, a matter of life and death. And a lot of it, um, when, when acts of racism are committed against our communities, there isn't um, accountability. There isn't a lot of noise around it, a lot of visibility. Um, but that's just one example of a life and death um, situation within our, our communities um, at large. And, and one example um, of racism and how that impacts in our state. Um, you know, I would love to, and we can talk about this for a really long time, but I know that we are running a little bit out of time here. Um, 
which I apologize. This is a great conversation and very important one. So um, if anyone wants to chime in into that really quickly, otherwise, you know, I want to just leave us um, overall with, with the call to action um, and really get at, you know, at all of us to share, you know, what, what, what do we want to our audience here with us today to take away? Um, you know, perhaps I wonder what are some one or two things that, um, you know, folks should do and can do in order to continue to support the quality of life of Latinos here in Minnesota. I'll go really, really quick um, because we have probably not even one minute, but <laughs> I'm not trying to take away. And I, I do endorse what you just said, um, certainly about racism in Minnesota and how we need to tackle it as a community. But just my real point is um, for, around the economic piece that equity provides opportunity and choices for our people. And we know that there's a lot of inequities that have been growing. They're not disappearing, they're growing. Um, and so racism disempowers, disempowers us as a community. And I feel that we, have a, we need a new conversation about um, strategies and actions that we need to take to empower our community um, through action um, to be able to have those choices, social and economic positions to have choices so that they can build prosperous and, and thriving lives. Um, and with that, I'll just stop and thank you so much for the opportunity. What about you, Rosita? Uh, gracias, Irmita. <laughs> Sounds pretty the diminutives in Spanish. Uh, yeah, uh, along the same lines that um, Ruby was mentioning, I would say that uh, the call uh, of action for us is uh, about uh, how we make sure that uh, we are part of uh, the conversation in the allocation of that uh, surplus of $7.1 billion. So, it's important to support these equitable investments in that same uh, way that Ruby explained, you know, in our families and communities. And they have to translate in very concrete uh, policies like affordable childcare, uh, affordable healthcare, uh, regardless of immigration status for many communities in Minnesota, not only Latinos, but others. Um, education debt relief, I agree to. Uh, tax fairness. Uh, should be some justice in that as well. And the support uh, were essential workers uh, and uh, small businesses and uh, also strengthening the, um, the nonprofit sector that serves those communities. I will just be really, really brief to say that I think, um, you know, we talked a lot about really trying to understand the role of structural racism and the Fed, Minneapolis Fed, along with our colleagues, launched into this whole series on the role of structural racism. Um, and we actually did try to quantify, you know, if we were able to close the race gap for all race and ethnicities in Minnesota, our GDP would have increased by $6.6 .6 billion every year from 2015 to 2019. So, I mean, this is older data, but um, really we recognize it as a drag, not only on individuals, but also on the economy. And it's not only, I think Irma, you were talking about individual acts of racism, which is which are very real, but there's also systemic racism for folks who think that, um, you know, I'm personally not racist and never did the racist thing and didn't engage in that particular thing. There are structures um, and really kind of the way our many facets of our society of like, who gets social security benefits and historical legacies and in policies and programs that we've created through redlining or other things like that, that have kind of systematically and intentionally blocked people from opportunities to either advance uh, economically, but also to generate what we, you know, intergenerational wealth. And so these things are intentional. And I think it's important to think about the system that we need to also influence and not, um, you know, obviously individual policies are useful and important, but really ultimately looking um, to kind of change the foundation as I was talking about earlier. Thank you. And, and um, Rodolfo, and of course, last but not least, um, Justice Page, last few words. Well, I just wanna say thank you everyone. And um, this is a very engaging com uh, conversation and I guess it's just, but has to motivate following on further uh, interchanges and uh, more like uh, this kind of open 
uh, talks about what are the issues with Latino communities. I see a future where we are going to need to address uh, more urgently. I hope we are not going to be there, these issues, because the demographic change is taking place. We arrived to the estimated uh, population of 350,000 20 years earlier than it was estimated in 2010. And that is a high light, that is a red light already, because we are there and we haven't yet solved the problems. I am very, very much aware that we need to follow up with a justice page uh, initiative to change uh, regulations, laws, and uh, policies. And uh, we need to do that quite quickly right now. So uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Irma, for a wonderful facilitation in this uh, panel. And thank you for uh, the participation of everyone. I hope we can come together again. Thank you for the Reserve Bank and uh, the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis for organizing this. And I hope you can call us back because we need to keep on learning from each other. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, big, big question and no simple, simple answer. But the reality is that everyone here, everyone listening, has the power and we have to be engaged. One way to be engaged, and it's just one thing, we have the power to vote. If we vote, I can't guarantee you that change will happen. But if we don't vote, I can guarantee you that change won't happen. And we have to use that power. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you again so much um, to the Page Education Foundation, to the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, uh, Rodolfo, Ruby, um, Rosa, and everyone you know behind the scenes um, to putting this together to our amazing interpreter as well. Thank you so much. Um, we know how hard it is as bilingual folks to do this simultaneously. So thank you so much for providing that bridge to our community um, that speaks um, Spanish. And, and I'll just leave by, you know, um, there are a few of our community members who unfortunately um, cannot vote. However, you know, we can all do our part. I, I, I cannot vote and I am still organizing and I am still fired up and I am still knocking on doors and I am still supporting people that can. Um, so, you know, you do not have to um, if you can't vote, but you are in this democracy together. We have a voice and it is our duty for ourselves and for the next generation of Latinos here in Minnesota to have better opportunities than the opportunities that, that we had. And so that is our mission. That is why we are here. That is why this conversation is crucial. We will continue to um, have it and we will continue to um, see it in action and really get at ways that this this, is, this can change in a positive way for our community so that, again, we have a better quality um, moving forward and we are thriving instead of surviving. So thank you all so much for your time today for the conversation. Um, and we are looking for um, an opportunity to continue this, this conversation and discussion moving forward always. So muchas gracias, se me cuidan, abrazos y que tengan una linda noche.